a lot of things happened post pandemic and during pandemics. Yeah, I mean, it was just a really unique, uh, unique time. And maybe someday we're going to go back into another one. You know, you never know. Yeah, this will be like historic archival footage. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we've predicted the future. Damn it, Evan. <laughs> well, I guess we should go ahead and intro the guest. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great intro for this. <laughs> this is start of Fallout Five. This episode of Unloading Me is not brought to you by your favorite food delivery service such as DoorDash or Uber Eats, but it could be. You can obviously tell from this frame, I use those services quite a bit. So help me out and help the channel out. Reach out to those companies and tell them to sponsor this fat ass. Now, back to the show. Hey guys, welcome to the next episode of Unloading Me. I am your host, Jared Ralphie Allen, and on today's show, we have the one, the only, Evan Hughes! Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Jared. Oh, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, and it's just a pleasure to meet you, man. I was good. Damn, I was about to say it's a pleasure to meet you. Ah, oh, I'll beat you to it. <laughs> <laughs> My show. My show. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, no, welcome, man. It's, thank you. Thank you so much. This will be, uh, you know, clearly edited that we didn't, haven't been talking for like 30 minutes and rambling before no. this and forgot the intro. We clearly <laughs> didn't do that at all. That would never clearly. Happen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure this is how like, actually like a lot of, you know, I feel like a lot of local podcasting is like people that know each other. Yeah. But at the high level, it's probably like you bring someone in and you're like, this guy's promoting a movie. I don't really know him. So yeah. we're going to like do it. So it's actually pretty cool to do it like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it kind of like for me personally as an interviewer, it kind of like gives me a different muscle to flex a little bit because, you know, you can have a conversation with anybody and that you're, you're best friends with and just kind of casual conversation. Sometimes cool. But this is more, like I said, just unique. And you forget to ask certain stuff because you're like, well, I already know that about him. Yeah. You know, and now you're like, well, I don't know anything about him. I could throw out whatever I would ask. Yeah. Um, I always have the guests if, if they drink, if they smoke. I, mean, I don't want people to be comfortable. Yeah. I'm actually straight edge, but yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, but I don't have any problem with it being around. Okay. Yeah. I do it more just for my anxiety and just kind of chill out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I understand. Yeah. It's totally cool. Uh, I had Adam. I don't know if you've ever met Adam Sweet Titty Smith. I don't think I have. What's um, his deal? <laughs> he's an older gentleman, redneck comedian. Uh, he, you'll know him if you ever go to the Looney Bin, and okay. he has a belt buckle that flips open to a beer holder. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Um, his he literally has the catchphrase "sweet titties," and he has merch for it, and he's a big merch guy. Is he a touring guy? Um, no, he's just a local Tulsa. Tul oh, he's a newer. Okay. He's a newer guy. He just oh, got okay. on Fresh Faces like a month ago. Oh, interesting. Um, but he's hilarious. I just had him on like my second episode of season two. But redneck comedian, just a good blue collar guy, but genuinely just a nice dude. But he's great in the merch. He's really just pushing to trying to you know launch his brand and everything. And he's just genuinely funny. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, I've always thought him. You know, comics like we all need more merch. Yeah. But we've always been kind of like scared to do it because it's like, oh, who's this guy? I think he is. He made his own hat. You know, yeah. like we've we've always had that level of shame associated with us that's different than like local music. Yeah. We're like a there'll be a local band for two months and Everest bands and everything. And no one says anything. Yeah. But in comedy, you'll get heat for that. Yeah. You know, to use the wrestling term. Yeah. You know, which sucks. I know. I, I've tried to find a way to help break that, but I mean, I'm trying to like, I, I mean, I have stickers and stuff like that. I'm working on t-shirts. Like, I have the logos and stuff done and I have some templates. Like I have my own unloading meat shirt that I use for my, you know, whenever I do like big shows and stuff like that, I'll wear it underneath a blazer or something like that. Yeah. But like, yeah, I know it's, it, <sighs> You're not going to win no matter what. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. mm -hmm. it's like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Sometimes you're going to piss off somebody in the crowd or somebody in the scene somehow. That's so true. Um, just try to be authentically used what I try to do. Yeah. And just keep pushing. I mean, like, I am a big proponent now. Just do the work. Like I said, I'm a big fan and big, uh, I'm just a big fan of Cody Rhodes. And he had a quote that was like, go from undesirable to undeniable. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good damn good quote. Like, cause like, you know, he left WWE on his own terms uh, because he was stardust and he was stuck Yeah, and they wouldn't let him just be Cody Rhodes after his dad died. And he left and he went on his own indie tour, built, built his own self as a heavyweight and became his own, like, you know, brand and launched AEW then came back and, you know, was a main event, like big multi-million dollar, you know, guy. 
And that's kind of inspiring for me. You know, he left on his own terms and stuff like that. Yeah, and, bef- before I even got into comedy, I was watching a, a Raven shoot interview, and he was talking, and they asked him about, um, did you ever watch any of those RF shoot, shoot yeah. interviews? Uh, it was one of his. He's got so many out yeah. there. Raven's got a ton. But they were asking him about, like, how certain guys get, like, a ton of heat in certain locker rooms and certain other guys don't, like, how to avoid it and stuff like that. And he was talking about, He's like, whenever I'd go to a new locker room, because he went, he was in Portland, and then he was in Florida, and he was in WCW, and he's in ECW. He was like, I would go up to everybody and shake their hand, you know, because there's people like if you don't do that, yeah, people will be like, who the fuck's this guy think he is? You know, yeah. didn't even come over and say hi or anything. And he's like, he he said that he would watch new people coming into the territory, and they would just you know be at their locker and stuff like that. And a couple of weeks would go by, and they haven't introduced themselves. To anyone he's like all of a sudden they'd have all this heat with everybody yeah and he's like and i i feel like that too like all the people that have really met me and gotten to know me they're like oh yeah that's evan but it's like if i don't show up and shake hands it's like that's when you'll get the most heat you'll get heat from people that don't know you that are in that are in the scene with you or they've joined up they're like who the fuck is that guy you yeah. know like fuck that guy yeah you know so you you have to kind of go around and shake hands a little bit yeah you know i mean that's that's what i've learned too you're exactly right with comedy yeah. i mean i'm i'm not the first guy i mean i've talked on the podcast before of like i'm usually the guy that's like i'll stand off until i know somebody or i'm friendly i'll be kind of quiet and stand off and i'll just be smoking my vape or something like that over there chilling uh i'm not the first person who's like hey nice to meet you i'm jared ralphie allen i need to be more uh yeah. i'm trying to be especially with building this and getting podcast guests and stuff i need to be more outgoing it's just it's more like if I'm in front of a microphone or you know on stage or something like that, I'm comfortable. Um, but you know, get me into a a bar with you know a hundred people and I get like, whoa, you know, yeah. what I mean, as far as trying to get a started a conversation with a complete stranger, it's a little awkward for me. Yeah, and that's what Raven said too. He he said that he would talk about that to guys and they'd be like, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to, you know, I don't want to interrupt this guy. And he's like, there's ways to do it like respectfully. You can just be like, hey, I see you guys are talking. I just want to say. I'm raving uh, like I've seen your work. I'm just happy to be here with you guys. And and even sometimes some of those people even might want to hate you. But if you at least go give them their respect, they'd be like, all right. Yeah, he's uh, but he, you know, he came and said what's up to yeah. me. And he like he knows who I am. Yeah. You know, he gets it. He's he's cool. Yeah. You know, Yeah, because I never want to come off as like an asshole in the scene or anything like that. I, I'm just a pr- proponent of doing the work, like just, you know, keeping my head down. I don't want to ever start drama or anything like that. I just want to keep trying to just drill and get the reps in and do the work and you know, always have a good reputation. I'm big on reputation and people knowing that, you know, hey, that guy, you know, he works his ass off. Yeah. And I'd rather that be what I'm known for than just, you know, a loud mouth or anything like that, you know? Like, right. Because, you know, with Tulsa and stuff like that, and I'm sure it happens in every scene, there's, you know, word spreads fast as far as reputations and stuff like that and perceptions. And sometimes that's going to be the kiss of death sometimes and if you're in a small scene or something like that. Well, and everyone will have a different one too, which yeah. is tricky, you yeah. know? It's hard to navigate. I mean, there's it's, it's it's almost like high school drama all over again. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's from what I've from what I understand, it's pretty much the same everywhere. Yeah, you know, it's not nothing that happens here is unique, and nothing is going to go away. No, so. no, nope, <laughs> just keep doing the work and push through. Yeah, and, uh, if you're in in it for the, I mean, I'm not in it to do be rich. I'm not, you know, I'm not right. looking to be the next Burt Kreischer or anything like that, or you know, you know, just or Dave Chappelle or anything like that. I'm looking to just like. If this can be where it pays the bills and everything like that, I'd be very happy. Yeah. Eventually getting, you know, some subscribers, getting some, you know, sponsors on here and just kind of building this to where I can be comfortable and just continue to do comedy. I'm very close to where I can just be comedy full time. I paid off my house, paid off my car last year. That rules. Uh, between that and the divorce, I'm pretty comfortable as far as like I DoorDash now between, you know, doing comedy and taking care of my kids. And I can just do that full time and it pays the bills. And I'm just trying to get that to where. You know, if I can get a couple of sponsors on here, get this built a little bit closer, uh, this will just be comedy full time. That fucking rules, dude. Yeah, man. Uh, oh, yeah. That's just a big thing, man. Uh, that's why it took so long to launch this brand and everything like that. I took it very seriously. I take this very seriously. It's my baby. It's my thing that I've very, very proud of. Yeah, you can definitely tell. I mean, there's there's like a podcast where you'll show up and it'll just be, yeah, it's in some random room or something. But then ones that are actually like set up and have, has, have the equipment and everything. Yeah. And then you're just like, man, they fucking care about this. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how was your drive to Bartlesville? It was, it was nice. It, sometimes it's good to just get in a long car trip and put on music. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I completely agree. I mean, so I always ask that as my first question, and there's a reason for it. Um, it's a bit of a drive from Tulsa to Bartlesville. It's about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on where you are from Tulsa in, in Tulsa area. 
uh, South Tulsa, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I do that about two, three times a week for open mics. And it's not like I'm trying to like rub it in anybody's face or anything like that. It's more just a thing of like, I always wanted people to, pre- I appreciate the people to come out and make the effort to come out here. And I also like people to see like, this is what I'm doing two, three times a week for the work too. Yeah. So when people are like, I've had people cancel, they're like, oh, I'm not going all that way for Bartlesville. And I'm like, okay, cool. But like, I'm just like, I appreciate effort. So I'm always appreciative of people coming out here. So I always ask that as the first question. So I'm grateful. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank you for coming out. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I've actually, I've done, you know, for comedy and this is for comedy. Yeah. Uh, I have, I've done quite, quite a bit of traveling for, uh, you know, usually you might, uh, get your gas money covered if it, you're driving like four hours or something, you yeah. know, but I've, I've driven for a lot of shows to a lot of towns even further than Bartlesville. So over the years, so I've done this for like eight years. So there's, I put a lot of miles on different cars. Yeah. I just, I, I just, I always appreciate the effort. Like I said, we talked about a little bit before. Um, so yeah, I'm grateful for people coming out making the trap trip out here and yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so man, also, how long have you been doing the comedy full time? Like, as far as like, how long have you been in the scene? Uh, probably well, uh, full time, uh, less than two years. Okay, but uh, I started my first set was March of 2015. Okay, so I've I've been, and I've never really taken a break outside of the pandemic, so that was my break. But other than that, I, I've been doing, you know, many sets a month since my first month. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any big highlights? What, what what's like your crown jewel of your highlights so far? Uh, let's think. So, um, January of 2016, I they did the roast of Evan Hughes at the Looney Bin. Uh, it was like a completely packed, like sold out show, and that was when I was almost one year into comedy. Damn, nice. So that was uh, w- one of the best nights of my life. Um, I've opened for some cool people. I've opened for like Creed Bratton from The Office, and um a bunch of different comics that like low down and stuff like that. Like, uh, you know, like Ian Lara and Laura peak and Kelly Ryan and just comics that are, that are really funny and, and doing stuff. And, um, I've, I've brought in, uh, comics like Sam talent and, um, uh, let's see, Gavin Matz and, uh, helped, uh, get, uh, different comics booked, uh, in Tulsa that, that aren't from here. Uh, so, um, I've done quite a bit. I'm going to do my first special on uh, November 10th of this year nice. at Lowdown. Um, it's not really like publicly announced yet, but I'm just kind of slowly word of mouth telling people. Okay. Um, so that's going to be uh, probably the biggest thing I've done in comedy so far, which is like obviously like eight years in the, or so in the making. Yeah. And uh, a friend of mine named, he goes by Sneak the Poet. Uh, he's done the Fire in Little Africa documentary and a short film called Enlighten and some other stuff like music videos and other different things, and he's going to be the director of it. And uh, Bobby Ross is involved and paid. Uh, so it'll be like you know four or five people on the cameras, and it'll be something that you'll be able to see like at Circle Cinema and things like that Nice uh, when it eventually, eventually drops. So I'm really, right now, I'm just going to try to go up as much as I can Um to get ready for that show. So I I already actually have a lot of shows in place, even in October and stuff where I'm going to know that that's going to be like leading up to the special, you know? Yeah. Um, so that'll be just like getting, getting my reps in and like finalizing that set that I'm going to record. Sure. You know, I hope this doesn't sound like I think anything of myself, but it's like, I, I, I know a lot of people and like I'm that, that room is only like, it's like a hundred is a sellout. Yeah. So I'm not worried about whether or not I can sell tickets. Oh, sure. Like yeah, I yeah, could have, yeah. I could have put more people in, in Vanguard or whatever it was, yeah. but that room I thought would look really great on, on camera. Sure. And, um, it's just nice. It's got the low ceiling. And it's like kind of intimate, but not like too intimate. Yeah. You know, it's just honestly, as someone that's done comedy for this many years, it's, it's kind of, one of the big goals for everyone is to do your, do your special, Yeah, you know, whether that's going to be on Netflix or YouTube or Amazon or, uh, whatever you get it on, um, just to do it. I mean, you know, if you're a band, your goal is to, re- you're going to record the album. Yeah. It's a mile. You know, this yeah, is the yeah. album, you know? So, um, I feel like I got the right director and it's the right time. I felt like ready before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, and I came back out after not performing for a long time. I didn't, I felt rusty and I wasn't in my, in the zone the way I was before the pandemic. And I, I just, I almost had to start, 
start back over, like, you know, thinking about recording the special, I was like, no, I'm, I'm a ways away from it again. Yeah. You know, it was a big setback. So, um, now it's just, everything is falling into place. And, you know, I, I hope that me doing it makes even more people. I know like Nicole Miller and Landry Miller and all these other Millers are recording specials <laughs> yeah. in town, but, uh, I hope more comics are like, yeah, it's the time to think about mine. You yeah. know, it doesn't matter who you are. Like, and, and, you know, I waited eight years to do it. So if you want to wait three more years to do it or whatever, like I get it. Yeah. You know, cause it's all about feeling comfortable and feeling ready. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, congrats, man. I'm very, oh, thank you. That's, yeah. that's just awesome. It's, it's, it's inspiring, man. It's, it's funny. Cause I'm like, it feels like an accomplishment, but it's not just because, and I'm just saying that in terms of like, anyone could do it. Yeah. Like you could do comedy for six months and record an hour. Yeah. But, I, I do feel like the amount of thought I put into it and the amount of time and stuff. And when I do look at my jokes, I'm like, I know I have enough where I'm like, I, I can do it. Yeah. You know, I and, mean, and be happy with it. It's, it's, it's getting in that threshold of comfortability versus like, you know, you can be proud of the product you're putting out. Like, exactly. This episode of Unloading Me is not brought to you by your favorite mobile banking app, such as Cash App. Man, I love using Cash App. Especially when I'm doing things other than buying drugs. Cash app. So, as we look around the room, is there what was your favorite like growing up, like as far as like cartoons or like uh, action figures or anything? Like, what did, what did the young Evan Hughes? My watch? era would have been like He Man, Thundercats, GI Joe. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. I'm probably forgetting something huge. The Smurfs. Nice. You know? <laughs> well, so the Barbie movie dropped. I don't yeah. know if you've seen it yet. Not yet. I'm watching it this weekend with my girls. It's great. It's so much. It's so much more. It's a, it's a comedy. Yeah. And a lot of the marketing was a little bit confusing to me because it it doesn't push how funny it is. And then when you see it, you're like, oh man, it's so funny. You know. That's. So it, I'm excited. It, for that. I, I would compare it to. Do you, did you like Elf? Yes. If you like Elf, that's one of the most comparable movies to me in, in the way that, like, you know, Will Ferrell was, like, at the North Pole, and then he's in the real world. Yeah, like the they fish out of water barrier. Barbie, too. They do the same. She's in Barbie land, and then she's in the real world, and they've even got, like, the travel sequence. And Will Ferrell's in both movies. It was almost kind of a, a nod to that. It's got that, that wholesome funny where it's like, yeah, you know, there's not going to be any, like, random nudity or anything, but yeah. it's just like you're watching it, and you're like, it's just very, very wholesome, funny. Yeah. Um, another Will Ferrell movie that's kind of similar is Lego Movie. Yeah, Lego I actually Mo- haven't seen that yet. Really? I uh, know. Highly recommend because uh, when I heard because Will Ferrell's like the the head of Mattel or something, isn't he? He uh, is. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like what happens at the end of the Lego Movie too. Is like he's the he's the big bad, the head of the Lego kind of thing. Dang, okay. Uh, highly recommend the Lego Movie. It's so good. Okay. Uh, Lego Batman. Stranger Batman's than good. Fiction, and I love Will Ferrell. Uh, Lego Movie. <laughs> I didn't watch the sequel. Uh, I heard it was okay. But the first Lego Movie and the Lego Batman is very funny and very good. Uh, if you like Will Arnett. Isn't it funny how sometimes they don't quite market exactly? Like you'll see the movie and you'll be like, "I I think this is this is what it is." Yeah. But like when you saw the preview, it was almost like the trailer doesn't quite tell you what what it is. Yeah. Um. Felt the same way about the Spider Verse movies. I yeah. adore those. But I don't know if you've seen the second one. No, I haven't. Uh, it's beautiful. It I, is one of the most beautiful, breathtaking movies I've ever seen. As far as like, it's just gorgeous. I heard that. I, that that that. Me bringing up the Barbie movie and that I saw it probably made me seem like a guy that seemed like every, you know, like real plugged in. Oh, like, no, yeah, yeah, I saw everything. But it, there was actually a long, I actually didn't have a TV for a lot of years. So I kind of went dark on everything. And uh, now I got a TV and I've been, I've been trying to kind of catch up and I'm watching stuff that I missed. Okay. Uh, what's some of the things you've been watching recently? Uh, uh, oh my gosh. Uh, what's on your Netflix queue? Um, what have we, so I watched that, uh, Beef. Uh, on Netflix, I haven't watched it yet. That's with uh, oh, it's um, great. It's like uh, Ali Wong. Yes, right. I haven't watched that yet. Uh, it's so good. You'll love it. It's so funny. But originally, every time I hear beef, I think of the bear on Hulu because the the restaurant in there is called the Beef. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I did. Beef. <laughs> I did a uh, Terrell Norton's podcast, and I I came on there to talk about beef, but he thought I was supposed to talk about the bear or something like that, <laughs> and it was confusing. Have you watched <laughs> the bear? No, I haven't seen that. Watch The Bear. I would recommend The Bear. It's on Hulu. Very, okay. very, very, very good. Yeah, we uh, just watched. What did we watch? We watched Nice Guys the other night, which uh, was one that I had missed. And Ryan uh, Gosling. That's a great movie. And Russell Crowe. And Russell Crowe, yeah. That was one that I had just missed. Yeah. You know, so that's the kind of movie I'm going back to. And uh, watching Barbie is what got us to be like, oh, yeah, Ryan Gosling. And we kind of looked through what he'd put out. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, Nice Guys is great. That's a really good movie. Yeah. Uh, and that's another movie that was marketed and like you didn't quite know what you're getting into until you watched it. Uh, but yeah, that's surprising. When there's another one, uh, Walking Phoenix did a movie. It was Inherent Vice. Uh, that was around that same time. It's kind of similar as far as the tone of just that wacky kind of, I don't know, kind of conundrum who done it kind of thing. It was uh, funny too. Like the end of Nice Guys, all of a sudden you feel like you're watching. Uh, um, Oh, what's it called? Um, the one with Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker. Oh, Rush Hour. Rush Hour. Like it's got kind of a Rush Hour ending to it. Yeah, it's Buddy out Cop. Of nowhere. Uh, and it, I think a Shane, a Shane Black movie, which makes sense. Yeah. Uh, he also did. I mean, a lot of people were controversially Iron Man three, but yeah, he did that, and he's done a lot of different movies. Uh, but yeah, Buddy Cop comes to mind with that. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wish I could remember more movies that we've been watching, but just yeah, just catching up with old stuff. Uh, I recently just finished Barry on Hulu or on, on HBO. That's a Bill Hader show. I've, I've heard it's so great. Very, very good. Uh, a show. I love shows that like you could tell going in that they had a, a beginning, a middle and an end. And they had like a clear ending of where they wanted to tie it up. And this show does not drag on. It's like 30 minute episodes and it's like eight. I think it's like 10 episodes a season and there's four seasons and it's done. And the last season, he directed every single episode. And they're really good. Uh, Have you met his dad before? No, not yet. He's, like, always around Tulsa, and he's just, like, the sweetest guy. He's got so many stories. Really? Yeah, he's so funny. I would love to meet him. I I, I think either Jace Kinzer or somebody was in here recently and said the same thing. He was was at the Fur Club or Fur Shop once and just uh, talking around. Yeah, he's, like, he, he used to be at Cellar Dweller all the time, and now I think he's more at Arnie's. Okay. Yeah. Uh yeah, I haven't met him yet. Yeah, you'll love him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, see, he used to do stand up too. Really? Yeah. See, that was something I didn't know. He was like, he even performed with like uh, Jerry Seinfeld back in the day, like before Seinfeld. Yeah. Like he had stories about a whole bunch of comics and doing sets like all over, like even in Vegas and stuff like that. Oh wow! Was something I didn't know about him. That's 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 cool. I, yeah. I, I love these little pockets and then these little things in Tulsa that you just never know. Yeah. Um. Like I said, we talked about how like we think Tulsa's on the bubble. It's just like, it's so fascinating. It's just little things that are there's so much talent, there's so much history here, both good and bad. Um, that you know kind of got a little bit swept under the rug. Uh, yeah. But it just it's one of those things where it's I don't know. It's there's there's so many. It's just this crazy uh, melting pot of uh, cultures, both like Native American and just like you know everything else that's come through here. Uh, I don't know where we're going on tangent on that. Just <laughs> no, I agree. It's all the the ingredients that make it what it is, and and there's nowhere else that really has the same ingredients. Yeah. So that's why we're a totally different entree out here. So man, uh, growing up, tell me a little bit about everything you growing up. You grew up in what, Australia. Or, no, or actually, was, so that's <laughs> that's funny you say that because uh, it's on your Facebook profile. That's just on the Facebook profile. Only. I was wondering. I was going to bring it up just because I was like. I have some Australian like history. I'm like, Ugh, Australians. Yeah, I was born and raised in Tulsa. Really? Uh, the backstory to that was, um, I was working like a quasi government job. Yeah, and I had signed a contract saying that I wouldn't use social media, and then I got into stand up. And <laughs> that uh, all makes sense. The girl that helped me out with it was like, "Well, if you don't have social media, you're you know, they're you're probably not going to get booked very much because they need to be able to like tag you in it." She's like, "Everybody's got a social media," and it's funny because I said the same thing to. Nicolo, like a, a a year or so later, when he was first getting into it, I was like, "Dude, he, he was co- totally off the grid." I was like, "You got to get social media. Like, you're getting into stand up. Like, you got to have a, a Facebook or something. Yeah. You know, you just get so people can see what you're doing and see that you're active and be present yourself to the community in yeah. that way." And um, so I I set it up and I put it under my name, but I got that dog as the profile picture, and then I put Australia on it with the Tulsa because I knew if they just put my name in and they saw the Australia, they'd be like, well, it's not him. And yeah. It just had the dog and I had it really locked down. And then I, I never took off the Australia and I never changed the dog profile picture. So that was all my day one kind of hiding, hiding on social media. So stuff. you could tell if I did my research or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think part of what makes me like, uh, as Tulsa of a person as I am is that I've never lived anywhere else. Okay. You know, so I'm a lot of people that have spent time living in New York or China or, LA it's like they end up getting influences from those places and yeah. kind of becoming who they are and it's like I've only ever lived here I can tell you 
all about Tulsa. I am Tulsa through and through. That's kind of how I am. Like I, I lived. I mean, I grew up in. I went to Dewey. Yeah. Uh, and then I grew up actually and lived in Copan. I don't know if you know where that is. That's like right on the border of Kansas and Oklahoma. It's the border town of Kansas. Uh, yeah, so I, I have a couple of So I, I did a show in Dewey once. Oh, okay. In that one little theater that used to be like an adult theater. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got the marquee on the outside. And I actually thought I had a show there set up this last month, but it was it ended up being somewhere else. Uh, the same booker that booked me there years ago booked me again, and I just assumed I was coming back to the same place. Oh, okay. But then it turned out to be a whole new place. But um, I think Copan is where um, uh, my friend's dad lives and they do big uh, fests out there and stuff they do yeah and um, there's a big lake out there copan lake and stuff like that too do, like a big country music fest there's or a, something like there's that. that and then there's also the 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 indian powwows out there too okay they do out there too cool. so like yeah there's a couple different things out there but it's a small town like it's one of those towns where like the only thing they have is like a gas station and a dollar general okay and then they have the lake you know what i mean so it's like it's very rural uh there's maybe a thousand people if that oh, cool um but it's just one of those things where i grew up out there and I lived in Tulsa for a little bit on Riverside, um, but I've yeah I've kind of been around this Bartlesville Tulsa area. I've never been outside of this. I mean I've, I've traveled, but I've never lived outside. Oh, of same. The same yeah, area. I've done, done a bit of traveling, but yeah. Yeah, I, I was a little bit of a. I've talked before. I'm a little bit of a World, world of Warcraft whore. Yeah, <laughs> nice. I had four different women. Three of them, yeah. Well, I, well, I mean, fly, uh, flights and plane tickets to fly out there and have some fun. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, Three nice. World of Warcraft. Okay. The weirdest thing, yeah. Okay. It just kept happening. This is going into my question for you later. Oh, okay. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I, 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 not that we got so serious. We've kind of had a serious tone on this podcast a little yeah. bit for a comedy podcast. I don't usually like, yeah, I mean, I, I usually don't uh, just try to like constantly, like, you know what It's I mean? hard to be on all the time. Yeah. I'm usually just chill and yeah. Yeah. Um, but I do appreciate stuff like this because I feel I can get to know the person a lot better through this than a 10 minute conversation at a bar with loud music and everything going on. Oh yeah. You can't really, you're never going to remember those conversations. No, especially when alcohol's involved, <laughs> <laughs> but you're straight edge, right? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm like the CM punk of comedy. <laughs> Not really. I actually have his autograph on the wall over there. Oh, you do? The yeah. rules. Yeah. I have him and Finn Balor's autographs framed over there. where did you meet them at? Uh, Finn, I met at an NXT show and then CM punk when I actually was a, Smackdown show. I didn't meet him, but it was like at the at the merch thing. They had signed ones. Uh, <laughs> my two wrestling memories I have of going to those live shows. I was at CM Punk's last Smackdown before he quit and walked out. And I was. It's the famous match where he wrestled at that time. It was uh, Dean Ambrose. Now it's John Moxley. But CM Punk was sick and he shit his pants during the match at SmackDown. Oh wow! It was at the BOK Center in Tulsa. And I remember being that because I met Sign Guy. I don't know if you know who Sign Guy is. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, yeah. I got um, pictures. Me and my uh, my daughter got pictures with him and Sign Guy. And, like we were shaking hands and then you know got, we we're in the audience with him, and that was the match where CM Punk shit his pants. Damn, uh, well, it's not the first one. And then the second time I went, when my youngest daughter was actually my second wife was actually pregnant, we went to an NXT show. They had a house show in Tulsa, and. Um, it was at the Pavilion, Tulsa Pavilion, or something like that. Yeah. And Finn Balor versus Samoa Joe was the main event, and we were there waiting in line to go in. And like, it was the Pavilion, and there's multiple gated off like like rooms, mm-hmm. and they had the concourse concession area that was gated off, and they were basically using that for the catering for the wrestlers. And well, you could look through the gates, and I could just see Finn Balor and Samoa Joe just sitting there at a table having salad, just eating. Oh, a wow. And they're the main event match. It's like this feud. And I'm like, yeah, they're just sitting there, co- just having a nice little chat, and eating lunch. <laughs> kayfabe, kayfabe. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite part of that, though, was uh, the ending of the show. I don't know if you know who Finn Balor is. Yeah. Uh, he's Irish, very thick accent. He started singing Garth Brooks to send the crowd home happy. And uh, he started singing Friends in Low Places to the crowd. Wow. So, well, you'll never hear me complain, cause I got friends in low places where the whiskey drowns and the beer chases my blues away. And I'll be okay. Yeah. And 
it's just a great moment. And Man. I miss that kind of stuff. I love yeah. that kind of moments. I thought that was, I feel like that NXT show was more fun than the BOK SmackDown show mm-hmm. because it was more intimate. There was maybe, maybe 500 people. I mean, it was a packed little room. Yeah, uh, I, I would like it. Everybody should go to a, a small wrestling show yeah. at some point. That's why I, like an indie one even. That's why I f- I love AEW so much because like even though it's they're getting into bigger arenas, it still feels like an indie. Like it really does. They've captured the indie spirit so well. Um, I'm impressed with Wembley. I don't know if you've heard about Wembley what they did. No. Um, they booked Wembley Stadium. Oh wow! And that's where they had that one SummerSlam back in the day, right? Yeah, SummerSlam uh, the 92? Ninety two. Yeah, yeah uh, Bulldog uh, and Bret Hart. Hart. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's like. A hundred like eighty thousand feet. Like, oh yeah, seat, it's gigantic. Theater. Yeah, and so they announced it at the beginning of the year, and people were like, "Oh, they're going to do Wembley Center, which is a smaller kind of like how Kane's has a Kane has a the side room." Yes, Wembley has the stadium, and then they have like the Wembley smaller arena next to it, and it's like that's like a you know a ten or fifteen thousand seat arena or something like that. Um, people thought assumed they were going to do that, and they're like, "No, we're going to do Wembley Stadium," and they haven't even ma- announced a match for it. There, there's no matches or anything, no card, and they've oh. already sold like sixty seven thousand tickets. Wow. And it's just this huge thing of like every time the, the people are like, oh, you can't do this. They're like, watch us. Yeah. And that's kind of just like inspiring to watch. You know what I mean? It's just kind of cool. And like to me personally, as a fan of the product, they've never really let you down as far as, like I said, storytelling or anything like that. Like storytelling and things happen to a logical end. Um, it's kind of like Game of Thrones where their characters like a hangman Adam Page who goes on a two year depression and like is he good enough to be a world champion kind of storyline and it culminates in a main event match and he wins the title. Like it took two years of a storyline to do that. And some of the, the, the decline in, in maybe wrestling attendance here in the States, it hasn't been the same in, in every country, right? Yeah. Like it probably in, in Britain or whatever. It's We're kind of going on a wrestling Renaissance right now. Um, yeah. And I don't want to say AEW led it, but it, it really, it kind of started from the CM Punk pipe bomb. If you really, if you will. Because he started doing that anti, like, this is kind of like, for anybody that was like, man, WWE's kind of like lame now. Yeah. He was the first person that was kind of in the scene and was like, you're right, with that pipe bomb. And it kind of spread this kind of anti-authority, anti-thing with WWE. And I honestly think that's what started with the indies getting bigger and bigger, and ROH. I mean, Tony Khan bought Ring of Honor now. yeah. So now he owns AEW and Ring of Honor. And he's doing both simultaneously. Yeah, I, I don't know why I can't think of his name right now, but uh, the dude that brought out the gun in the Attitude Era... Uh, Brian Pillman. Brian Pillman, yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of that same energy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, is this real or not? Yeah. yeah. And then, like, even, like, the AEW video game that just came out, Fight Forever, is so much fun. Like, just a blast. Have you ever played... Are you a big video gamer? Have you ever played games? I, I played games, like, way, way long ago. Like, I, I haven't had a game system in forever. But, I mean, I'm I'm familiar with, you know... Did you ever play, like, the old-school wrestling games, like No Mercy or WrestleMania 2000, like the N64 games? Oh, uh, no. I, I'd be, like... Way before that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, those games back in the day were kind of like considered like the best wrestling games ever made. Uh, the N64 ones. They were just really, really good games. And the, the grappling system, like everything about it was just fun, perfect gameplay. Mm-hmm. Um, AEW launched their own game company and they put a couple million into it. And dude, it's really good. It's like a basically a new N64 wrestling game. It's very, very good. It rules. It's just an arcade style wrestling brawler. And it's one of those games where it's easy to pick up, but it's hard to master. It's very, very hard to master. There's so much intricacy to do it, to it, but it's super fun. Yeah, I think the ones that I played, I mean, it, this is, had like probably like Razor Ramon in it, like <laughs> this long ago. Like Tatanka was in the game. Oh, okay, you know? so like, you've been like Super Nintendo or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember like uh, they had what was it? WWF Attitude, I think, and it had Ahmed Johnson. Yeah, remember Ahmed Johnson back in the day? Oh. I feel so bad. I forgot Brian Pillman's name because I. I watched like the Hollywood Blondes, and I watched his Dark Side of the Ring and everything. So yeah, his name was just like wasn't. That's a great show, Dark Side of the Ring. Blood. It's yeah. sad, but it's like it's. I mean, it's enlightening. I've seen most of them now. I think some of them are insane, like the Doink one. Yeah, like you're like, what the fuck? The the plane ride from hell is hilarious. It's yeah. sad, but it's like it's, it's. I mean, it's infamous. Yeah, that plane ride from hell. If anybody is a wrestling fan or you don't know, look up plane ride from hell with WWE. Uh, that trip basically changed the company. Just one plane ride that was from an overseas trip. And those, and I, I feel like that episode and certain other ones will make you dislike wrestling if you're not a fan in a way where it's like I watched them with, 
I watched that one with my girlfriend, and she yeah. was like, fuck all these guys. You know, but, like, you could watch the one on, like, Owen Hart, and she's like, ah, oh, some of these wrestlers are, like, good people. Yeah. You know, but, you know. Uh, but the, the plane ride from hell really didn't make anyone look good. No, especially Ric Flair. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when he's, what, gro- or pushing himself against that what, flight attendant, and he's naked with his robe. And there or- was another one, too. I think it was Scott Hall who was acting real shitty, on yeah. um, among others. But Yeah. Yeah. You know. uh, <laughs> It's funny that you brought up Owen Hart. Owen Hart is now a playable character in AEW Fight Forever. Oh, that's that's because like because you know with the fallout that happened with that was a really bad poor choice of words to say <laughs> fallout of Owen Hart. Oh man, that's not gonna be the clip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Martha. Um, <laughs> so with the untimely passing of Owen Hart <laughs> over the edge. Um, Martha Hart was basically like fuck WWF, fuck Vince. Yeah, I want nothing. He's his name's not in the record. Like she stripped, she wanted nothing to do with that company. Yeah, you know, rightfully so. But like when AEW came around, she was finally like, okay, I, there's another wrestling company that can like give his legacy, and it's not like I'm like putting his name in the Hall of Fame to somebody that killed him. You know what I mean? That was her big thing. It's like I've never put Owen Hart in the WWF Hall of Fame. It's like you know, hey, here's a reward for us accidentally killing you. You know what I mean? She, I can understand her point of view. Yeah. But with AEW, they launched the Owen Hart kind of foundation and the cup, and it's like a tournament, and every year they have a wrestling match uh, or a wrestling tournament in his name. And uh, they put him in the game now, and he's it's the first time since, like, 1996 or something he's been in a playable wrestling character. So it's a pretty big deal to have Owen Hart in the game, and it's, like, in his classic old-school attires and everything. Yeah, my uncle was at that show at Kemper Arena with his kids. Over the, oh. Yeah, and I was talking to him about it, and he was like, yeah, we were at the one, you know, where the guy fell and everything like that. And I was like, I was like, that's one of the biggest things that's ever happened. And yeah. There's documentaries about it. There's books about it. You know, it's like that and Chris Benoit. So like that. Gigantic. Like, yeah. yeah. And he was like, really? You know, like, yeah. That like, was one of the crazy. The craziest things that ever Never happened, happened in, wrestling. in wrestling. Yeah. yeah. Um, for those that don't know, I mean, I don't know, I'm sure everybody knows, but Owen Hart was a legendary wrestler, part of the, the, the Hart family of like 13 really legendary wrestlers. And Stu Hart trained a whole bunch of people. And he died, what, like just a couple minutes into his intro. Uh, he was supposed to be lowered down from the rafters of the Blue Blazer, right? I think it was. Yeah. yeah. Blue Blazer. Yeah. But he was supposed to be lowered down as like a superhero, and the cable was not hooked up right or something. He just fell to his death in the ring, and even then, he kind of died a hero. Like he was telling the refs to get out of the way and stuff, and he saved those people's lives as he went to the mat and died. Like the dude went out a fucking hero. And then they kept the show going, and they they wrestled in the same ring where there's literally like a hole. In, yeah. yeah, yeah, they just had a gigantic hole in the ring, and they wrestled around it. And like the match after that was Jeff Jarrett in a match and Jeff Hart, Jared is one of Owen Hart's best friends and tag team partners. And he had to wrestle in the match after that, get around the hole of his dead friend. Like insane. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's insane to think of now, but it's also like, I mean, I know Mick Foley wrote about it in his book. A lot of people wrote about it in their books of like, it's kind of like a damn if you do, damn if you don't like you had like 15,000 people that were in shock of what just happened and stuff like that. Like, what do you do to get people's mind off of that? Like the show must go on, but what do you do? Like, yeah. And like, in hindsight, most people would have said cancel the show. An event happened, like send people home, to stop it. But it's also like it's on pay per view. It's live. It's the, it was the nineties. It was kind of people didn't know what the fuck to do. Yeah, and yeah, it's just unfortunate. Yeah, they would have been in, in a position to uh, give back everyone's money, refund everything. You know, refund yeah. pay per view money, refund ticket sales, and they just you know weren't willing to do it. You no. know, that was Vince. Yeah, you know? that was Vince. Uh, and then. The only thing that brings to my mind that is close to that is like, so like I always remember Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler afterwards. Cause they cut the camera to them right when it happened. And you had to watch them watching Owen B stretcher to stuff, but you're just seeing their reaction as they're trying to like, just talk to the audience. And that had to have been like the hardest fucking job ever. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Um, the only thing that was ever close to that was the time that Jerry Lawler had a heart attack in the ring. I don't even ever heard of that. I heard of it, but I, I don't think I ever, uh, I don't think I saw that. He had a match, like, Jerry's, was at the time he was in his 50s. Was it televised? It was televised. Okay. He had a match, it was either Miz or Ziggler, it was something that was on Raw, but he was commentary at the time, too. And so, basically, he had a match, and then he was coming back down to just go do commentary. And he was winded, and he had a match, and he was he was blown up. And he had a heart attack ringside right after his match, as he's doing commentary, and Michael Cole has to keep it going. And oh. it's just common, calmly just acting like nothing's going. 
and is just like keeping the ring going and nobody can even tell that the thing's going as he's watching his like good friend having a heart attack and possibly dying and the paramedics are taking care of him. Wow. And it's just like you never realize how professional these guys are and how good these guys are at their jobs and how hard it is sometimes. Uh, so yeah, Michael Cole, hats off to him. Yeah. That, 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 that's a legend. Wild. It's also crazy too because like there's been this new appreciation for Michael Cole because like for a lot of times people are like, I hate that commentator. A lot of yeah. people hate a Michael Cole. And mostly it's because he's a Vince chill. Like Vince is always in their ear and he's telling them word for word what to say. Yeah. And anytime Michael would have to do like, you know, this is vintage or, you know, welcome to the universe and all that stuff. All those key words that are all Vince, like you can only say this. And he was very good at that. That's why Vince kept hiring him. But once Vince got let go from the sexual allegations and Michael Cole could just be Michael Cole, he became a way better commentator. He became more loose and everything. And people were like, I actually like Michael Cole. He's really good. Yeah, nobody should have to work with somebody in their ear like no. that. Mick you know? Foley quit because of it. Yeah. I mean, he was a SmackDown commentator for a little bit, and he quit and went to the TNA, because, and he didn't talk to Vince for, like, three years. Well, they were so big, too, on, like, I mean, even, you know, you could you can't say any pronouns. Like, you have to constantly be saying the character's name for yep. branding. It's like Undertaker did that. Undertaker did You can't say he kicked him. Yeah. You know, it's like, always say the brand name. Yeah. Uh, or the... The famous, we got to cut to the wrestlers watching the match in the backstage, and they're watching the TV, watching the ring. What, like, and like the monitor is here, the wrestlers are here, and you're watching both. So, like, if you really think about it, the wrestlers are not just we're just to basically go off that the wrestlers talk, watch TV like this because they're just sitting here like this, going watching their like their feuding rival like this because it looks good on camera, but it makes no total sense at all. Yeah. <laughs> Just mention a disbelief a little bit. <laughs> you just go with it. It's wrestling. Go with it. Um, it's kind of like Transformers. You just go with it. I mean, I watched the latest one and it's just like, it, ugh, I didn't like it. Uh, Rise of the Beast. I haven't seen it. I'm a big Beast Wars guy. I like I like the Beast Wars. Oh, you're a fuzzy. I grew up in the '90s, so like Beast Wars was really good for me, and it was okay. And it's, it's any time now, these movies just feel like they're just here's another toy to market. You know what I mean? It's just kind of where we're at in some of these movies. Yeah, and I mean just uh, just what they're doing as far as like you can't even hardly release a movie if it's not some kind of nostalgia or something that's already been run and proven to be a hit. Yeah, like they're only wanting to do guaranteed hits. Yeah, you know. Um, I have a I, I ranted out of <laughs> I ranted at the end of my se- cellar dweller Sunday because <laughs> I brought up the new Matlock. Have you seen the trailer There's for a Ma- new Matlock? There's a new Matlock starring Kathy Bates as okay. Matlock. Which okay. I love Kathy Bates. Yeah. I have a whole thing about Kathy Bates. Um, but if you watch the trailer, there's a scene in it where they're like, Matlock, huh? And she goes, yeah, like the old TV lawyer. So in universe, she has no connection to Matlock. It's just in universe, that's a TV show. Okay. So why the fuck is this show called Matlock? It's literally just name recognition alone. It has no attachment to it. Yeah. I mean, you could just you can kind of see through the the veil of like, who has power and who's green lighting all this yeah. stuff, you know? It honestly feels like these. So <laughs> I'm a toy collector, right? So I'm, I'm obviously uh, big into Transformers. Transformers have this hilarious uh, convoluted history. It's very hard to kind of figure out the universe and like the continuity of stuff. Cause there's so much different continuities mm. and a lot of it has to do with, Oh shit, we're about to lose a trademark on this name. Put that character in the next thing. And so there's lots of names that are just reused because they're trying not to lose the trademarks. And that's where a lot of these things happen, where it's like, it feels like a lot of these movies and TV shows are coming out. We're like, uh, we need a new Matlock. We're going to lose it. <laughs> oh, man. I didn't even think about that. Because that's what happened with a lot of Marvel stuff. Uh, Marvel got back Ghost Rider, Fantastic Four, and a couple other things recently just because they didn't put out enough movies in time. And Marvel, the, the rights revert back. And a lot of that stuff happens. And yeah, that's what I kind of feel like. Sometimes this stuff just like put out content with the name. It has no attachment to it. Yeah, and, and certain people, like I, I'm trying to remember his name, the guy that did like uh, Beetlejuice and... Um, uh, Tim Burton. Tim uh, Burton. Yeah, I mean, he Beetlejuice and uh, Edward Scissorhands and stuff were such fantastic ideas. You know, he created iconic forever characters and yeah. stuff. And then it felt like his career just kind of became like, I'm going to do another Planet of the Apes. I'm going to do another Willy Wonka. And it's sort of like... It's really well done, but it's like, where's your your new characters you were giving us back in the day? Yeah, you know, where's the it, it new, felt where's like, the new. It felt like Tim Burton made his own mythos and brand, and then people were just like, let's just see the Tim Burton brand on this, and yeah. the Tim Burton brand on this. 
Mm-hmm. And it's Tim Burton's unique spin on Alice in Wonderland and Planet of the Apes. And it's just the Tim Burton S thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, uh, what you're talking about. Yeah. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, Frank and Weenie, you know, just a lot of all these different ones. And it kind of reminds me of, um, I, I read an interview with uh, David Gilmore from Pink Floyd, mm-hmm. and it was post uh, the band breaking up, and they didn't really want to do Pink Floyd again without Roger Waters. They were like, you know, that's just going to create a bunch of drama and stuff like that. They were yeah. like, he was content to just drop a solo album, but, you know, going to the label, you know, he still had his deal with Columbia Records, and they were like, well, we'll give you this budget for your David Gilmore album. Or if you call it Pink Floyd, we'll give you this budget. And the difference was like astronomical. So he was like, well, that kind of puts him in a corner where he's like, all right, well, I got to get, you know, Nick Mason or Richard Wright. And we got to do Pink Floyd, even though it'll piss off Roger. It'll be a bunch of bullshit. And a bunch of fans will be pissed. Yeah. So they don't want to do it. But it's like I want the recording budget and the touring budget. Yeah. So I think that happens a lot of times with um with all, all other sorts of uh, entertainment as far as, like, what the studios are willing to, to bankroll. Yeah. I mean, I can even relate it to certain, like, like there's people that that, that, that shit on Burt Kreischer. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it may not be everybody's cup of tea, um, but he's known as, like, the party machine. He's the machine. Like, he has to be the drinker and, you know, the shirt's off. He's a big party guy. And, like, honestly, he kept a lot of comics going through COVID and stuff with his, like, his, uh, like, drive-in movie theater tours and stuff like that he did. Yeah, like I'm not, I'm not big on shitting on successful comics at I'm not, all. Like, no, period. do the work. They're doing the work and they're just successful. More props to him. And he started his own fest, and he he brought out you know Mark Norman and all these yeah. people, and uh, Kelly Ryan who came here and did uh, the lowdown show. He he took her out on the road for a couple dates, and then now she's on Anthony Jessel next tour. Yeah. But it's sort of like every person that helps you along the way. It's yeah. like that might not be your type of comedy. Same as in music. It's like that might not you might not like jazz or you might not like metal, but it's like you got to respect someone that's put that many butts in seats and is that successful. Exactly. That's also helping other people in the process. Yeah. Like how many people you might he- like more. Yeah. And that's kind of like, it, that's inspiring to me, man. Like I, I would rather, like I'm never one of those people, like uh, as I'm trying to go to this podcast, stuff like that too, I want to, you know, bring people along the way. That's why I want to do spotlights on this stuff. Like, I don't know, man. Like it's just, there's, there's plenty to go around in my opinion. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's, you know, I, Never want to shit on another community or anything like that. Like, like you just said, like if they're successful and they're pushing their putting butts in seats, more props to them, man. Right. Um, but I think that for him personally, because of that brand, it might it has to be exhausting to keep that up. As far as like you got to be the leader, you got to be the one that's always partying. You know, you're like after that, we got to have an after show party. We got to keep this going. Like well, that's the pressure I think of like you know even like Michael Jordan with the Chicago Bulls back in the day. If you ever watched that documentary they did on the the Bulls, Mm-mm. um. Well, it just kind of shows that it was like, you know, it was a lot of hard work all the time, you know, and all the pressure and, and yeah. everything. And it was just like that was his his role and what he took on and the person he became, you know. Yeah. And it's like it's often not fun to be that that workaholic entertainer, yeah, you know, um, to do what they're doing. But then a lot of people start to rely on them, you know. It's yeah. like he, he can't quit tomorrow because – so many people depend on him, you know, and not even just fans, but also other people in the industry and other people that work for him. Yeah. There's an ecosystem um, he's built. Like basically. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, him, him selling out an arena is going to get a lot of other people paid. It's going to put food on a lot of other families. Yeah. Uh, tables. And, you know, even just uh, shout out again to Kelly Ryan, uh, one of the funniest comics I've ever seen period. And she's coming up really big now. She's a, a comedy store paid regular. Nice. And she's on, you know, Anthony Jeselnik's tour as an opener and she was on Burt Kreischer's tour for a bit. And, um, yeah, it's, it's such a cool thing. Um, any, any comic that gets that big, that's also helping out a bunch of other comics. Yeah. Like, like it, how, how can you hate on like, that? I, I can't, I, it's a double negative, but I cannot not support somebody that is genuinely like out there to help other people too. Like, right. You know what I mean? Like they, they seem like a genuinely good person that's just trying to do the best they can, just have to do their life too. When you can't scroll back on any famous comics like uh, social media and get back to the days when they were just posting hate on other comics and stuff, yeah. like that era in their life didn't exist. You yeah. know, it's like that never. You know, surrounding yourself or just feeling just feeling enraged all day at other people's success isn't going to lead to success of your own. Yeah, you know, there was a great quote about that, but I can't remember what it was. Well, also, here, like, but. also since like the 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 birth of like the Austin comedy scene and like the, you know the 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 flux of people leaving the LA scene to go to the Austin scene, like just in, just in general, since 
post COVID, like the comedy scene's changed rapidly. And I don't know, it's felt like the brotherhood's gotten even stronger just you see with between comics as far as people like this like the last kind of place where it felt like you can just kind of say whatever you need to say. And like you're just I don't want to say it's a safe space, but you know what I mean? Like there's more like this is the last freedom place where you can really just be yourself and be your authentic self and just kind of be welcomed. Yeah, and, and funny is funny and it 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 varies. It's such a big range of styles. Yeah. You know, it's like the the comics aren't even really comparable at some point. Like I was gonna try to think of like two that are way far off, but um gosh, I can't but I mean you know, take like a Shane Gillis or something like that in his style versus like a, a Mitch Hedberg versus oh, yeah. uh, you know what I mean? There's yeah. just, there's so many there's it's almost like music where there's like there's country, there's rap, and you can like whatever you like and yeah. somebody out there's gonna like it, but funny is funny and it, it feels like if you're that funny you're gonna rise to the top somehow. Yeah. It's like know? the people that were shitting on Tom Segura for his latest like sledgehammer show. Like I loved it. I thought it was a great special on Netflix. Yeah. Um Tom Segura did like 300 dates or something like that on his last tour. Like it was, wow. it was crazy. Like he basically like everything, all of his tour dates that got canceled during COVID, he just kept them, pushed them and like just did a world tour. It's called I'm coming everywhere. I'm coming everywhere. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, it was like 300 dates internationally all over. And at, you know, he did a sledgehammer Netflix special during it too. And there's a doc on YouTube. You can watch like the making of it. And it's just like how exhausting that is. And like, there's people on Reddit stuff that are like, oh, it's not as good as his last special, or you can tell like he's exhausted. Stuff. I'm like, well, obviously he's exhausted, but like, can you imagine how much bank he's making? Like, his family's set for life probably from that tour. Like, he's doing arenas. Yeah. And, you know, 300 arenas in a row, that's got to be some good bank. But like, the way he's got his comedy podcast empire, his studio, like, we talked about the ecosystem, like, all his production team, the documentary team, like, there's a lot of people and a lot of mouths to feed that are underneath him. Well, and- it's always funny, too, just to even see like, you go you can go to um the comment section on youtube of like a guy performing on you know the tonight show or something yeah. like that and there'll be someone in the comments like this guy's not funny and it's like well for one thing he's on the tonight show yeah you know and it's like they don't just find someone randomly on the street and go hey can you come do the tonight show tonight we're going to find out if you're funny yeah. it's like there's so much work i mean the comics that i've known that have got to do late shows have had to submit multiple tapes um through an agent and then they come back and they're like, this is what your set's going to be. Joke number two from tape one, joke number three from tape two. And then they tell you what your set is. Yeah. And it's, and it's a lot to, to get to that point uh, yeah. in your career to be able to have that, have that moment. It's, it's not random. Yeah. And you know, it's like, and it's a lot of work. I'll, I'll trim the name. Cause I, I never like, I don't like the name drop on that. So I'll trim it. But like I, I had uh, the pleasure of doing a podcast episode for Josh Wolf. Yeah. Um, him and his son came in. They were at Canes, and then I got to do a. I got to produce an episode for their, their podcast for him here. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that was the best two hours of my comedy career, as far as like just being able to just sit, like I got to shoot an hour with them, and then to talk with an hour with them, and just getting to like rack Josh Wolf's brain right there, and just like him, like that's really where like he was like just like keep doing the work, keep doing the work, just keep being ready. Like a lot of this is luck, but a lot of this is also just being ready for the opportunity, like. Just be that guy. I don't know. I have a paint, have a fucking paint can holding the weight down. <laughs> but it's just one of those things where it's like he was like, just do the work. Always be ready for an opportunity. Don't be begging for opportunities. Just be ready for them. And dude, that's such valuable fucking advice. Yeah. And I don't know, man. Like that. That was three months into launching this podcast. I was able to do that for him, and it was kind of just like. Not that it, like, a made it moment. It was more just, like, I'm on the right path kind of thing. Like, you know what I mean? And it was a good time in my life to where I got to have him on the couch. And just that was some good advice I got to have. Yeah. And just kind of see, like, a guy that's a pretty high up there just kind of rack their brain a little bit. And just have a good con- conversation with him and his son. Yeah, there was a quote I saw the other day. And it was, uh, people at the top, or people at the bottom are competing and people at the top are collaborating. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, that's such a good such a good like motivational yeah. thing thing to remember that the people at the top you know aren't hating they're just kind of like you know working with each other and they're not their their eyes are on their own work at the same time yeah and some of the uh some of the indie studios already agreed to the terms of the strike and so they're able to move forward because they're paying everyone yeah. what was being asked of them so I, I, got, I got to be an extra on uh, one of those uh films that was one of like the approved ones that's been still filming during this uh strike because nice. they're they're paying everything oh, that yeah. they should be paying 
Yeah, Not that which I'm is like pretty cool. mansplaining you. I mean, you, you're an extra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you, you get what I'm saying. Like, I, I kind of feel like that. I can kind of, I feel that already coming around the entertainment industry, industry again. Like, like I see another boom coming. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Like alternative entertainment kind of stuff. Possibly. Depending on how long this goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but man, uh, do you have any questions for me? I do. Yes, uh, questions. I, hope you like these I do. Uh, uh, I think sp- I will. Specifically, how many times have you been in love? Ooh. <laughs> I was trying to get you at these. Romantic love with like a partner. I mean, I have two like, kids. Like, like, you whatever your definition of like in love. Oh, in love. So okay. yeah. So in love. Three. Three. Yeah. Um, I've been married twice, and then I had someone else I don't want to talk about. But yeah, okay, yeah. So, okay, uh, all right. Second question: favorite musical act of all time? Queen. Okay, okay. Um, I'm a big Freddie Mercury fan. Queen. Um, second place, very close, would be Foo Fighters. I love Dave Grohl. Oh, interesting. Um, so I wouldn't put those two close together, but I mean, I could. You could kind of say. I mean. Foo Fighters have some definitely some like stadium rockers. Like you could put like yeah. My Hero up there, like another one bites the dust. My third one would blow your mind. Gorillas. Oh, no, I could see that. That like, definitely. Especially with like this is like gorillas energy. Yeah. Um, there's a rap group right now called Zarface. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of them. Uh, they did some music with MF Doom, who also did music with Gorillas. Uh, but like their rap lyrics are very much influenced by like Marvel comics, wrestling terms, and stuff like that. They have a song called Nightcrawler, and I'm that's my favorite X Man. Like I even have him tattooed on my arm. Like yeah, I love cool. Nightcrawler. Uh, I love the character. I love the, uh, the backstory of Nightcrawler. I've always found fascinating because you know he was like I'm not religious, but like he was deeply religious. And as far as like the most devout Catholics or most devout uh religious people in the Marvel history, it's him and Matt Murdock. But he's vilified and people always wanted to kill him just because he looks like a demon and mm-hmm. like his outward skin. And I always found that fascinating, that contrast of like he's like the most purest soul, kindest person and is like most devout Christian and stuff like that. But everybody just wants to vilify him and kill him because of the way he looks like a demon. Did you see that uh Ryan Gosling movie too? Uh Was which it, one? Wasn't it called Nightcrawler? Uh that's Jake Gyllenhaal. Jake Gyllenhaal. A little different. That's like a serial killer movie, isn't it right? I thought it was where he was like going around to get news footage of crimes as they were. I don't remember. I never watched. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Maybe I'll I'll watch co- that. I'm confusing it with uh, the Son of Sam movie with uh, John, was it John Leguizamo. Uh, Son of Sam was. Um, who was that? Uh, what was that guy's name? It's around the. I think Leguizamo's in it. In it though, I can't remember who's. I can't remember who played it. We're going off on a tangent now on those movies. Those are weird movies. Okay, my third question. Okay. Pop tarts or toaster strudel? You can only have one. <laughs> and why? <laughs> oh, God damn it! Pop tarts, the variety. Oh man, that that's the best possible answer. Um, that's so. Also, pop tart bites are fucking fantastic. I don't I know like, what they did, but the like, ratio is so good. I like those too. Like the ratio between the the jam versus the icing on the outside, and the less it's just something about it is like it's a good bite. Uh, it's a great way to gain more weight. <laughs> I do agree with you. I do like those. But toaster strudels are good. Um, I so it's weird. Uh, I grew up in the country and stuff, so we we went deer hunting and stuff like that. Yeah, I grew up with like remember the toaster scrambles. Yeah, vaguely. Yeah, they still have them, but they're like egg, bacon, and cheese. So like my dad would get those. We go hunting. We'd have those, and so like, I grew up with those instead of the strudel ones. I didn't even know they made sweet ones for a while uh, growing up until like. It was, wow. like, a long time afterwards. So, yeah, I was always a Pop-Tart kid. So, yeah, I always did Pop-Tarts. Yeah. That's a good answer, though, to point out that they, they definitely had them in variety. I think maybe if Toaster Strudel had done more to uh, diversify I mean, I think their... I have Toaster Strudel whole box in my freezer right now, and I have Pop-Tarts over there. So, yeah, I'm a fan of both. That's a good question, yeah, then. That's a great question, <laughs> I was just trying to go, like... I love I that. thought you were going to be, like, this is going to go real deep because of the first question. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to kind of throw you off. I like this. I yeah. like this a lot. No, right. I, um, I like to get my candid answers on it. I like to really kind of just, you know, catch me off guard. And yeah. so thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Kind of random, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, Evan, uh, thank you so much for being here, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, this has been awesome getting to know been you, fun, getting to talk yeah. to you. Uh, where can everybody find you at if they wanted to book you or they wanted to reach the great Evan Hughes? Um, Evan Hughes on Facebook, Evan B. Hughes on 
Instagram. Um, I think Evan Hugs on Twitter. Evan <laughs> Hugs on no Evan B. Hughes on Threads. On Threads, I have a Snapchat still that I never open. Uh, <laughs> I have a TikTok, but I don't really use it. But you could find me on there if you want. Um, uh, yeah, I'll have a lot of shows. I we don't know when this is going to come out, but yep. it. I, I do the places I do comedy. I usually do them every month. Okay, so none of them, are, as far as I know, are going away. So you can. You know, find me at the the Vanguard or Sound Pony, Whittier, uh, Lefties, Black Wall Street Liquid Lounge, Renaissance Heirloom Rustic Ales, um, Spotlight Theater, and the ones I'm forgetting. And that might be why I, like we Hold haven't around. ran into a lot of the times because like uh, I have my kids every Monday and Tuesday, so uh-huh. I don't go out on Mondays and Tuesdays to the clubs or anything like that. So like if you like if you're ever at an open mic on Monday and Tuesday, like Bounty or Sound Pony or like well not Sound Pony but um what's Misty Von V's um the uh, alumni or like any of those like that i'm not out so i only go out like wednesdays and thursdays for open mics if i can yeah so i live super close to downtown so it's it's a lot easier for me to do a downtown show than it is to do like the like the go laugh yeah. or whatever you know it's just that's a bit more of a drive for me yeah. but is that less of a drive for you to do the broken arrow no it's it's more Oh, you have to add that past Tulsa? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, so I, I, I did that in June. That was my first time doing it. I did it with uh, Angela Teague. And yeah, those are fun. That was fun. a fun room. I like the place. I like it a lot, too. Yeah, I did that, and the owner's really cool. Um, Super great guy. Um, <laughs> I uh, I know we're getting ready to end, but like, I had Miss Treese on, and then I actually shot a commercial for her show out there. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I, I launched a full production studio. Like, I do this. I do commercials. I do you know video editing and all that stuff. So flyer work, all that kind of stuff. Um, so Miss Treese was like, "Hey, can I have you film a commercial for me for my show?" I was like, "Sure." So we went out there, and Gene just gopped in and like became a character and was like spraying water everywhere. Uh, and just he just randomly went off. And I was like, "I didn't ask him to do any of this, but this works." <laughs> dude, he's a he's a great dude. <laughs> he's hilarious, man. But yeah, he made the commercial so much better. Just like he just winged something and just went nuts. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's a great place, great people. Yeah. Um. So man, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Uh, Guys, this has been Unloading Meat. I am Jared Ralphie Allen. That's Evan Hughes. Peace. Bye. Have a great time.